Take a good long look at these five men and shudder a little. Four of them are exactly what they appear to be, engineers, professional engineers, methodical men. The fifth is an engineer too, and he is a methodical man. Innocuous looking lot, aren't they? But one of these men is also a cold, calculating, methodical killer. One man. Would you like to make your selection now? This pleasant looking gentleman? Or does he have a shifty eye? This debonair fellow? Or is that a cruel mouth? This fatherly man? He seems unduly nervous, doesn't he? Not a clue really in these faces, is there? They might even be your neighbors. Is one of your neighbors a killer? One of these men is. Perhaps you can put the finger on him. Listen now closely and catch a killer. So it's obvious our research on the subject of the compact automobile and of the engine to power it is perfectly clear. Chevrolet and General Motors have now given us complete freedom to create a totally new kind of car. A new kind of automobile for introduction in 1960. A compact, economical car. Entirely different. Unconventional. And so a far-sighted plan that had its beginnings in a research program that started some nine years ago moved into high gear in absolute secrecy. These men will be in the forefront continuously, day and night. Five professional engineers. One of them, a killer. So behind locked doors, each of the five engineers is free to design as he thinks best. But how do you get economy in an automobile? Economy of first cost and economy of operation. Well, the easy way to do it is merely to design a sawed-off, cut-down, squeezed-in version of a conventional car. And what you come up with is a car that looks and acts like a sawed-off, cut-down, squeezed-in version of a conventional car. You don't even have a good compromise, for you get a little economy at the expense of everything else that makes cars useful, comfortable, and practical. But the way to get true economy when you have enough advanced time, all the resources you need, and the know-how to do it right, is to design from the ground up, specifically for economy. For real economy, you know at the outset that the car must weigh much less, perhaps only about half as much as conventional cars. Well, you can't cut down the size of people, so you design the passenger compartment so the passengers, all six of them, will have headroom, legroom, and hip room sufficient for full comfort. And right away, you're plagued with the distribution of the weight, because only with the weight distributed properly on the front and rear wheels will your compact car have the handling ease and roadability Americans need under all conditions of load and road. And right here, all your years of exhaustive, painstaking research show you that what's right for the conventional automobile is not right for the compact automobile. What you want is the very best handling, roadability, and ride at all times when the driver is alone in the car or when the car is fully loaded. And you want the car to respond safely and surely to its brakes also no matter what the load. And even if you have to swerve with the brakes on hard. Uh, to do all that, you must design for as little change as possible in weight distribution, front and rear, between driver only and fully loaded. Cars can be designed to carry more weight on their front wheels or more on their rear wheels. What counts is the change from driver only to fully loaded. Let's consider a conventional car. With the driver only, 51% of the weight is on the front wheels, 49% on the rear. 
When you add five passengers and luggage, 55% of the weight is now on the rear wheels, 45% on the front. That means a 6% change in weight location front to rear. On this long wheelbase car, the change in handling and ride is barely noticeable. Now, let's consider a conventionally designed compact car, smaller and shorter, with a heavy engine up front. With driver alone, only 45% of the weight is on the rear wheels. With driver alone, the car tends toward nose heavy. Now, add five passengers and luggage. 53% of the weight is on the rear wheels. So your front engine compact car has shifted from nose heavy to tail heavy. An 8% shift of weight. That, because of the short wheelbase, makes a big difference in ride and handling, in comfort and peace of mind. Now, the rear engine compact car. The key is the weight of the engine. It must be light. To meet American needs, it must be powerful. If it were made of iron, it would be too heavy. With driver alone, the rear engine compact car has 61% of its weight on its rear wheels. With passengers and luggage, rear wheel load drops to 58%. Thus, the all-important change in weight distribution is only 3% for the properly designed rear engine compact car, the least change of any design. And look at the tremendous advantages of a rear engine car. A virtually flat floor and completely independent springing of all four wheels. Quadraflex suspension, the ultimate in compact car ride. So the outline of the new car is finally determined. But this is an unborn car, a paper car. But a paper car won't sell. So five engineers huddle again. Five engineers. One a killer, impatient to strike. First, a dummy engine of wood, of a different shape than a conventional automobile engine, to fit its location in the rear of the car, is built to exact size to check accessibility of parts and ease of service. The fundamentals are finalized. A radical departure from conventional automotive design, thoroughly proved in thousands of light airplanes. What the engineers call a horizontally opposed six-cylinder engine. But it's a long time from wood to precision-made metal, with all the parts made by hand, because they're all new. So time races along before specialists start the painstaking hand-fitting of the handmade parts. For here's an automobile engine that breaks with tradition in every way, yet follows the tradition of Chevrolet. An air-cooled aluminum engine for feather weight that requires no radiator, water cooling system, or antifreeze. With iron where iron is needed, steel where steel is needed. With the newest improved principles and the oldest in fundamentals. And when it all comes together, all the parts and all the pieces, and all the blood, sweat, and thought, and you put it on the dynamometer and fire it up. The dials and the pointers and the needles finally tell you what you have hoped and prayed all the time. You have a winner, a small, compact, 80 horsepower dollop of dynamite, the turbo air engine that purrs like a six-cylinder kitten and pulls like a chesty tomcat. A powder puff would sop up the gas it uses in a mile, and it's as stingy with oil as a dime store medicine dropper. Methodical men, which is our man? Behind other sets of closely guarded doors, with complete freedom to create the body that will assure a smooth unity of beauty, comfort, convenience, ride, and power for the new car, other methodical men 
are fitting together the hand-shaped sheets of body steel that will one day grace this brand new American automobile. And soon the body testing begins, for this is to be a unistrut body by Fisher, strong as a bridge to save the weight of a frame, yet roomier than a conventional car only 10 years ago. Finally comes the day when a completed packaged power unit, engine, transmission, differential, rear axles, is snuggled into a camouflaged version of the new body for the start of long, highly secret road tests. Thus one frosty cold morning in the dead of winter, a caravan sets out, a few cars, a few men, methodical men. Cloaked in the pre-dawn gloom is our man. He can wait no longer. What harm can befall anyone here? Is that what you're wondering? Ah, oh, yes. But you don't know our killer, do you? He's riding in the car ahead. His victim is right behind. It's impossible for any unofficial observer to tell what this new car will finally look like because of the camouflage as the test drivers point its nose north for the most rigorous cold test possible on the road, on all kinds of roads in northern Minnesota where icy winds hold the temperature under 20 below zero every long day of the testing. And later, as they huddle together, the cold weather starting of the new engine is checked and checked and double checked. Being air cooled, it warms up fast in only two minutes, even though it is 20 below zero. And as they hit the icy roads again, car and engine perform perfectly. Quick acceleration, sustained highway speed, and the sure-footed handling and maneuverability that mark the properly designed rear engine compact car. And because of its proper weight balance, the car simply ignores the big gusty side winds that whistle across the frozen countryside. What about hot weather performance? So, hot weather it is. And on the GM Proving Ground in Arizona, where it's 120 in the shade, and the new engine's finned aluminum cylinders and quiet cooling fan shrug off heat just as handily as they ignore cold. And what about hills? Plenty of those at the GM Proving Ground at Milford, Michigan, outside Detroit. And up she goes, with all the pep and zest of her big sister. In fact, here's a car with amazing performance. Shake and roll over the killing Belgian road. Pound and thump over solid concrete blocks. All the while, the road test miles mount up, month after month night and day, more than a lifetime of grueling torture every inch of the way. For this is to be the most tested and proved automobile ever offered the American public. These are roads that try cars' souls, and drivers too. And still she rolls on. And now you must meet the killer. The man Chevrolet General Manager E.N. Cole put in charge. Corvair Project Engineer, Kai Hansen. I'm afraid I must admit I am a killer. My job is to methodically drive cars to death, to be sure of their safety, to be sure of their durability and long life, to be sure they deliver every dollar's worth of value people expect from Chevrolet. But Corvair is a new car, we couldn't drive it to death, and we tried, believe me. At one time, we were pounding 15 Corvair test cars over all kinds of roads, more than a half a million test miles. Corvair is the most tested and proved compact car ever introduced. 
I am proud that I failed as a killer. And so, proved to the nth degree, the new engine goes into production in a plant at Tonawanda, New York, to be economically near the huge aluminum plant that will supply the magic metal for this great new engine. In fact, the brand new engine foundry is so near the aluminum plant that it gets its aluminum hot from the furnace, ready to pour. Parts come together now in a stream and instead of a single engine, methodically hand-built, there are now endless hundreds. And where once one body had to be painstakingly hand-assembled, Bodies, too, march down the production line. The body now gets sound deadening material for the quietest compact car ride on the road. And then, the miracle of modern final assembly, where front suspension and rear end power unit join body at precisely the right instant. And so, you might say, a car. A car of a lifetime is born, of blue-blooded lineage, into one of the oldest automobile families. A car with everything except high cost and high upkeep. A car stingy with dollars, but extravagant with pep, comfort, ease of handling, and plain old-fashioned fun. And a car whose dealers will be fully stocked with parts, coast to coast, from the very day of its announcement. And a brand new car, proudly wearing a brand new name, rolls out of a brand new plant. Corvair by Chevrolet, the only compact car that had time to be built. The standard Corvair, the deluxe Corvair 700. Corvair, a revolutionary new kind of car for the new kind of driving Americans are doing these days. Corvair, the only car specifically designed from the ground up as a compact car. The most tested car in the compact car world. Corvair by Chevrolet, the prestige car of the compact car world. <laughs>